hear our call to worship from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory.
This is a collection for this morning. Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest, and desire that which thou dost promise, that so, among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The epistle for this morning is found in James 1, verses 17 to 21, and it's on page 1288 of the Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. The Gospel for this morning is found in John 16, verses 5 to 15, and that is found on page 1148 of the Pew But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them, you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's uh, say the Lord's Prayer again. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
but rather fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus himself who suffered and died for us. And so our participation in this moment requires us to prepare our hearts and minds to set aside Christ before us and to know that we are in fellowship with him. And so the Catechism reminds us that we should prepare for this communion meal. Part of what we do is, we, is examine ourselves. We should look within and see, are we truly in Christ? Do we truly have a love for Christ and His Word? Do we delight in the ministry of His Spirit in our hearts and in our midst? Do we love the truths of Scripture? Do we meditate on them and apply them to life? Do we have a proper understanding of God's work of redemption, what He's accomplished for us? Are these things clear to us? Or is it all just a fog and a vague idea that God loves us? We should have a clear perception of that which God has done for us in Christ. Uh, we should have true faith that rests on that which God has done for us in Christ. Receiving His work, embracing it as our own, Resting in Christ as our own Savior. So we should receive these things in faith. And we should examine our repentance. Do we truly repent of our sins? Do we grieve over their presence in our lives? Do we endeavor to overcome and to draw closer to Christ through more faithful obedience? And so there's an occasion to examine ourselves, to look within and discover whether we have the Christian graces that are necessary to take part in this meal. Do we love God? And do we love the church? And so we look outside to our relationship with God. Do we have a desire for Him as the one who gives us life? Do we love the brethren? Do we truly enjoy meeting with the people of God? Do we treasure their friendships above others? Do we delight in uh, communion with God's people? We are brethren. We are members of God's family. Do we have charity to all men, not simply those who come to our church or those who are part of our broader church connections, but all men, even those who are outside the church? Do we love men? Are we concerned for their well-being and look for their good? Are we ready to forgive those who have done us wrong? Uh, there should be a forgiving spirit at work, especially in the communion meal. Because here we are reminded that God has forgiven us of our sins. And as Jesus has often reminded us, if God has forgiven us, we should forgive one another. And then we should examine to see that we have a desire for Christ to live for Him, to bring all of life under His Lordship and dominion, so that life is not simply worshiping Christ here in this hour or so of worship, but extends to all of life job, our home, our friends, our family, and so forth, all for Christ. We live for Him, and we seek to obey Him. And then finally, do we renew these graces by exercising them regularly, these spiritual graces of faith, knowledge, and so forth, repentance? Do we meditate seriously on God's Word? Meditate on the sermon that's presented. What does God have to say to me here? Do I take home something of that message and say, this is what I need to hang on to as truth for me. This is something I need to change in my life. Do we walk away with something from God's Word? Do we meditate on it? Do we meditate on the Scriptures through the course of the week? Either through direct meditation on the Scriptures or hearing perhaps a message. Uh, radio, internet, what have you. And do we pray? Pray fervently. Not just a rudimentary prayer, but sometimes privately, personally, praying fervently for our church, for ourselves, for our families, for our nation, and for God's work in the world. Communion requires preparation. We do not approach it lightly, as though it's an inconsequential thing. Uh, we need to prepare our hearts and minds to be ready to receive the Word of God. Next hymn, number 460, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 460, and we'll stand and sing.
Testament, after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, chapter 5. Now begin reading with the uh, 13th verse. We go into chapter 6, verse 7. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the trumpet, excuse me, the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, every one straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march, around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we pray for the help of your spirit, that in the opening of your word, that the light of Christ would be manifest among us. We pray, O oh Lord, that the glory of Christ, our commander, will be evident to us that we with Joshua would bow our knees before him, for this is a holy place. We ask for your blessings on us, in Jesus' name, amen. Letters began to circulate among the uh, revolutionary soldiers, indicating that there was a considerable amount of frustration in the revolutionary army towards the young American Congress. They had made promises and pledges uh, supporting the troops and providing for their financial needs. And yet after a considerable period of time, there seemed to be uh, nothing done for the soldiers. Some of the captains received these letters and determined that they would have uh, an irregular meeting, a private meeting among themselves to decide what they should do. And a couple of courses of action were proposed to them. One would be to uh, teach the people a lesson that they needed the army by having the army go out into the field and sit there while the British armies came into the towns and communities and wreaked havoc among the population, kind of like going on strike. Uh, the other uh, solution was uh, to actually go in and forcibly take from the population uh, what they needed in terms of support. If you're not going to give it to us, we'll take it from you. So these kinds of discussions were ongoing, and word got to General George Washington that these letters were circulating among his troops. So he first ordered that they should not meet 
in an irregular fashion, but rather meet at the regular meeting that was coming up. They, dis they agreed to do that. There was some suggestion that possibly Washington was on the side of the troops in this regard. And so finally when they met on the regular time, they were not expecting it, but General George Washington came to the meeting, and with all the captains of his army sitting there before him, he stood up and made a speech, one of the great speeches of the Revolution, in which he expressed his great confidence and his affection for the army, but warned them against these kinds of actions which were divisive and destructive to the people and to all that they were working towards. He urged them to trust in the young Congress and to allow them time to find the resources that they needed to support the army. He was sure that they would have their, their support. Not everyone was happy with the general's remarks. After he made his remarks, he had a letter which he wanted to read to them from one of the congressmen citing the financial position of the Congress. And as he had this letter before them, he tried to squint and read and see what was said. And he couldn't read. So he pulled out his spectacles, which they didn't know that he had to wear. And he put them on and he said, in my service for my country, I've not only gone gray, but I've also lost my eyesight. And in that moment of humility and humanity, Washington turned the hearts of his soldiers and they put their trust in him and they waited. The impact of the commander in the army can be profound. As he leads the people through distress and trouble and, and uh, perilous times, when they have a good commander, they can do that which is right and accomplish great things. And at that moment, because of what General Washington did, our democracy was saved from a military power, civil government was secured, and we enjoy the freedoms that we have today. Years ago, Joshua was faced with a tremendous challenge. He and the people of Israel crossed the Canaan, the land, excuse me, crossed the Jericho River, excuse me, <laughs> the Jordan River. I'm getting old. <laughs> They crossed the Jordan River, <laughs> and before them was the city of Jericho, and they were commanded to go and now and conquer the land before them. Joshua was a new leader. Moses was laid aside to rest on the other side of the Jordan. Joshua was now to lead the people into battle, and the night before going to war against the city of Jericho, Joshua uh, perhaps went off on his own out in, into the, the plains and began to look over the city, perhaps try to look for defensive weaknesses and consider what ways in which they could attack the city and bring it down. In the course of this, where he's faced with this insurmountable city in front of him, walled off and sealed off, secure, he happens to come across a man walking perhaps in the gloom of the night. And he's uncertain as to who he is. And so with his military bearing, with his command and control personality, he comes up to this individual and says, whose side are you on? Our side or on theirs? Now the individual has a rather ominous appearance. He has his sword drawn, ready for battle. And the answer of this one is, No, but I am come as the commander of the Lord's army. And right away, Joshua was confronted with the angel of the Lord who had appeared time and time again in the history of Israel. At key moments, at moments of battle, this angel of the Lord made his appearance before the people of God, assuring them of God's presence in history and time, working on the behalf of his people. Uh, 
you can find various stories and accounts of this angel of the Lord, this angel who uh, went with Israel as they uh, left Egypt. And when Pharaoh and his armies came after them, the angel of the Lord watched over them uh, above the pillar of cloud uh, that they had there. This angel of the covenant would appear, first of all, to Moses at Mount Sinai earlier when he called the Lord, excuse me, called Moses to follow him and go back to Egypt. This angel of the Lord was a, a, a vision of the Lord himself. You note that the in this text, in the fifth chapter, he says, I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. So he makes a distinction between him and the Lord. He is not the Lord, he is distinct. But at the same time, he says, take off the sandals from your feet because this ground on which you are standing is holy ground. And he receives the worship of Joshua. Now you know in the, the scriptures, created angels refuse to receive the worship of those to whom, before whom they appear. Remember in the book of Revelation, John sees the angel and wishes to give him worship. The angel says, no, don't worship me, worship God. Here this individual appearing before Joshua receives Joshua's worship. Tells him that he's standing on holy ground, which is evidence of the fact that God himself is present. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the covenant, coming as the Son of God, appearing in human form, pre-incarnate human form, to reveal his presence among his people. The Lord is present in the camp. What a tremendous vision Joshua had of just what he needed to know. When he goes to face the citadel of evil there right at the brink of the land of Canaan, this city of Jericho, and face what would appear in human terms an insurmountable task, he is reminded that God himself is present among his people. And the battle would be the Lord's battle. What a tremendous encouragement to Joshua to know that he was not on his own. But the battle is the Lord's. And the Lord himself would come to fight for his people. Maybe at this point Joshua remind, was reminded of the song of, of Moses that Miriam sang just on the other side of the the waters of the Red Sea that had collapsed over the armies of Pharaoh and the, uh, Miriam and others break out their tambourines and dance and sing the song of Moses in Exodus 15, praising the Lord who is a warrior and who overthrew the armies of Pharaoh, cast their armies into the sea. The Lord is a warrior. And Joshua is reminded of this. The Lord who appears before him comes in battle form, ready to fight for the kingdom of God, for righteousness, for the advance of God's purposes in the world. The Lord is not merely a dove who comes and offers peace. He is also a warrior who brings wrath upon the enemy. And this is how he appears before Joshua. We need to be strengthened as well today by this same vision of our Lord who is a warrior. Who engages in the battles of the Lord and does not leave us alone to conquer the forces of wickedness and evil in the world today. When we look around us we see impregnable fortresses. We see dominant forces of humanism and so forth in various institutions of our nation and around the world. How do we overcome? We see darkness at work in families and friends, and we wonder how can God's work advance? Perhaps you've had an occasion where you've sat with a neighbor, friend, or a loved one and talked to them about the gospel of Christ, and you see in their mind, in their eyes, like a wall go up, an impregnable wall. There's no interest. 
They're apathetic. There's a, 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 a subtle hostility to that which is being said. You're a sinner. You need to repent. You need to give your life over to Jesus Christ and follow after Him. A wall goes up. And they don't wish to listen to that. How is that wall going to be brought down? <clears throat> we need to be reminded that the commander of the Lord's army is with His people. And he will accomplish his purposes in the world. The battle is the Lord's. This reminds us that if the battle is the Lord's, then we must depend upon him and worship him. That we might know his presence among us and go forward with confidence and boldness in the calling that he has for us. There's a remarkable account here of the instructions that the Lord gives to Joshua. This is not going to be your ordinary battle plan with various tactics as to how to attack this city. There will be no ramps going up the walls, no uh, scaling of the walls, no lobbing of uh, mortars over the walls or anything like that. This would not be your ordinary warfare. This would be a miraculous warfare, a holy war, set apart in a miraculous way at the very start of this campaign so that Israel would know that the battle is indeed the Lord's. And though from this place they will go from city to city and conduct an ordinary war with swords and shields and so forth, this beginning of the war would impress upon Israel that at every point in the way, even in the ordinary forms of battle, the battle is always the Lord's. It's always His warfare. And one of the central things in the conduct of warfare is worship. Worshiping this glorious Lord. The instructions given to Joshua echo this idea of worship. The kingdom would advance through the advance of God's covenant word. The Lord gives instructions to Joshua to have the people march around the city of Jericho seven times, once each day for seven days. And on the final day, they would march around that city seven times. You have the idea of the sabbatical pattern being established. There would be seven priests with seven trumpets who would blow these horns as they marched around the city. They would have the Ark of the Covenant in their midst at the very heart of the armies as they marched around the city. The city was not a very large city, but the lines of the army would be extended all around the city as they marched around. And it would be an unusual thing for the people to do this. Walk around the city in silence, listening to these trumpets blow as we go all around. Why does God give us this instruction? Why this sabbatical pattern? Why the Ark of the Covenant in our midst? God has lessons for His people for their spiritual warfare in all of this. He intends to show us something of the way in which He works in our midst. And first, the emphasis is on faith. Trust in the Lord. He gives these unusual instructions to His people and commands them to obey. How often is it when God gives you some directions in your life and you wonder, well, what's the sense in that? What's the sense in coming to church Sunday after Sunday and hearing some guy speak in front of you for 30 minutes, singing these old hymns with, with a, a wonderful keyboard that's played wonderfully, but <laughs> it's old hymns. <clears throat> Why do we go through this week after week after week? It's Christ's instruction. It's His purpose. And slowly, silently, repeatedly, over and over again, His Word begins to take root. His Word begins to grow. Understanding develops. Suddenly you're seeing broader things, deeper things. You're having a greater view of the world around you and who you are in God's kingdom. 
slowly but surely, if you, as you are quiet and you wait and you listen, you obey, God does His work in your life, in your church, in your family, in your community. Day by day, slowly but surely, you do what God tells you to do. It's like going out on your job. You do your, your job. I used to work in sales. You do certain things over and over and over again. And hopefully the sale will come. And then you go on to the next sale and the next one. You just do it until you're building an income. You're building a home. You're building a family. You're building things. But it goes day by day. Sometimes slowly. Sometimes in a very boring way. But that's what God calls us to do. The elementary things of life. You just do them. In obedience before the Lord. And then suddenly amazing things happen. The sabbatical pattern enforces upon God's people the sense that they have to rest in the Lord. To trust in Him. That's especially the case on this seventh day when they walk around the city seven times. How do you think the army was doing after that seventh march around the city? I would think they'd be fairly tired. <laughs> and now they're going to conduct war. You wore them out. The battle is the Lord's. And we rest in Him. Not in our flesh. Not in who we are. Not in our strength or wisdom, what have you. It is the Lord's. It is a spiritual battle. And so when we look at the great evils in the world today, and we wish to overcome... We see the way in which wickedness has uh, worked its way into our society. We wish to target this and that form of evil and try to overcome it. How do you overcome it? There are all kinds of ways. Writing to your congressman, calling them up, protesting, writing letters to the editor, getting all kinds of uh, uh, relief efforts, social efforts, feeding and so forth. All kinds of ways in which you can do it. But you need to rest in the Lord. And recognize that the battle is the Lord's. It is a spiritual war that we are engaged in. And not merely a secular war. So the sabbatical pattern encourages the people to rest in the Lord and in His provision. The sounding of the trumpets affirms the same. The battle is the Lord's. Ark of the Covenant, the Word of God, is at the heart and center of that whole ministry. We live by the Word of God. We rest in God's revelation of Himself. And as we follow that Ark, we will have victory in life. We will overcome the world. Trust in the Lord. You'll be amazed at what happens. The walls came down. Jericho collapsed. The people came in. They conquered. They destroyed. They revealed the wrath of God against the, the wicked. And God went on through His people from there to conquer all of the land of Canaan for His church. Great things happen when you trust in the Lord. Commit your ways to Him. When you have citadels of evil in your home, your personal life, in your community at large, how are you going to overcome them? Don't do it in your own strength. But commit it to the Lord. Trust in His Word. Obey Him. Even in the meaningless things. And you will see Him do great things. Persevere in that which God gives you to do. You never know what God may do. I posted on my Facebook page a video of a uh, professor from Tulane University. Some of you may have already seen it in which he recounts how he was an evolutionary scientist, professor in his university, and he taught from the viewpoint of evolution. And argued it for year after year after year. And one day he had this uh, young woman in his class, a student who came up to him after a, a, a lecture, and she wanted to ask him some questions about what he had to say. She said, that was a great lecture, I got some questions though, and he saw that she had some legal paper with all kinds of questions, so okay, we'll sit down after class and talk. 
she comes by and she starts asking him a variety of questions. You'll have to watch the tape for that. But as he's trying to answer these questions, he begin, begins to have a dawning realization that his position makes no sense. It just doesn't make sense. Mathematically, the, he does starts doing some calculations as to how probable it is that certain things might happen. And it's entirely improbable. And he just goes through one area after another, and, and he just begins to affirm his own faith in evolution. We're here, and so therefore evolution must have happened. And as he's saying these things, he's realizing how hollow his arguments are. And then he goes on to recount how he changed his mind about evolution. He began to adopt creation science. He, he says, he puts it this way, I said, oh my God. And he didn't mean that in a profane manner. But it suddenly dawned on him that God created everything. And that's the only reasonable explanation for the world around us today. The light dawned. The walls fell down. He says he became a creation scientist, and then after that became a Christian. And received Christ as his Savior. The walls came down because a college student asked him some probing questions. And God, by His Spirit, took those questions and began to open his mind and allow him to see the foolishness of his position. You never know when the walls will come down. Ask those questions. Continue faithful in your witness. You never know. The walls came down. The Apostle Paul, I think, in 1 Thessalonians, in his letter to the church there, picks up the information here and reminds us that there is coming a day when the walls will once more come down with the blast of the trumpet and the shout of the archangel. There is a day coming when Christ the Lord, Jesus Himself, will come and bring this current world order to an end. He will conquer this Jericho and establish the new heavens and the new earth. Then we will see the kingdom of God in all of its fullness, its beauty and glory. And then we will see the commander of the Lord's army, a mighty host, including angels and all of creation. The commander of the army of the Lord he is present in his church. He's present with you in your daily battles. Trust in him. Rest in him. Commit your battles to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts that we would see the advance of your kingdom in our personal lives, that we would overcome the uh, sins that uh, uh, seem so difficult to, to rid ourselves of. We pray for the help of your spirit. We pray that you would advance your kingdom in our homes and our families and throughout our church and world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let's respond to our Lord and King by giving to Him our morning tithes and offerings.
serve God for all those many blessings to you. Father, we pray that your spirit would 
uh, minister to our elderly. We pray that you will uphold them in life. We pray that you will strengthen their hearts. That they might trust in you and rest in your care and provision for them. We thank you for each one and pray that you would give them, bless them with strength and health. Keep them from falling, O oh Lord. We pray that you would uh, bring them uh, safely through this world. We pray that your blessing would be on our families. We thank you for our children and pray that you would watch over and care for them. Protect them as they grow. Bless them in your word. We pray that you would watch over parents. Give them guidance and wisdom in leading their families. That they might know the way in which they should go. We pray for your blessing on them. Father, we pray that you would watch over us in our jobs. We pray that you would provide for our earthly needs. We pray that you would sustain us in life. Minister to those who are ill who are sick. We pray that you would uh, restore their health. We pray for your blessing on the work of your church. We pray that as the Presbytery gathers this Saturday, that your hand of blessing would be on the work of your church in this region. We pray that you would equip us to love and serve you. We pray for our churches. We pray that you would sustain them and uphold them by your word. Prosper their ministry, O Lord, we pray. We pray that you would help us to depend upon you and not on the arm of the flesh. Father, we pray for the greater work of our kingdom. We pray for uh, those that we've had occasion to meet in the course of, of uh, our efforts to witness. We pray for our ladies who we met in our ladies' tea. We pray, Lord, for... Uh, then that the witness we bore would bear fruit in their lives, that they would trust in you, and we pray that we would be a continuing ministry to them. We pray for those who attend our Wednesday group, that your blessing would be on each of them, that they too would be conformed to Christ's image. We pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing would be on our session. We thank you for their work yesterday, and we pray that you would support each of our elders and, uh, uh, and our advisor, uh, Bob Minnick, we pray, Lord, that you would sustain our session and strengthen us in our work and equip us to love and serve you. We thank you for our country. We pray that you would deliver us from evil, help us to overcome evil with good, and to advance your truth, your righteousness, your love and grace in every area of life. And we pray that you would help us to overcome the darkness and corruption of our world today. We ask for your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Final hymn, number 493. Who is on the Lord's side? Number 493, and we'll stand the
receive God's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.